Hello and welcome to Going With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guy. It's a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season four, episode 11, titled Rock in a Hard Place. See that? So there's a pun. Rock. Hard Rock place. star. <laughs> hard place. Yeah, yeah. It originally premiered on January 22nd, 1988. Hey, surprise. The writer? Dick Wolf. Not surprised. <laughs> I think he really wrote all these. He just put different names on them. Yeah. Yeah. You just looked around the room like, what's your name, janitor? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Colin Buxy, who we just saw. He directed Death and the Lady, you know, the porn mm. episode, and Like a Hurricane. Uh, ah. So the first. The first Caitlin episode. Uh huh. Basically, the first half of this episode was yeah. directed by Colin Buxy. So he's done both now. He's finished out his storyline. He's done with on, right. a weird episode sandwiched <laughs> in between them. <laughs> <laughs> He's still got one more coming. Oh, okay. Before we get started, I check in see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, you know, we've actually picked up a, quite a few subscribers recently. So we wanted to just take a moment to say thank you. Thanks for all the newcomers that have come to the show. Thank you for everyone who's been listening to us since episode one. Thank you to everyone who listens to this podcast, no matter how you get it, when you came in. We appreciate you coming along this ride. And this ride is me and John going through Miami Vice for the first time, not knowing anything about the show to get episode one, going all the way until the final episode and up until the movie. And just our roller coaster ride along with Miami Vice. And possibly the new rebooted version after the movie. We'll see how things go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> and Melissa, who has seen the show at least seven times all the way through <laughs> and is our resident Miami Vice expert and full linguist on Don Johnson hair. <laughs> <laughs> the shaggy mullet, the blow dry mullet. No. <laughs> it just keeps getting longer and longer. I know. Like, it gets bigger. It gets bigger is what happens. The wind drag on his chase scenes <laughs> is just getting horrendous. Pretty soon he's going to wear a ponytail. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you know, there is a scene in this episode which they make a joke because all that you can see of him in the picture is his mole. His hair. Yeah, they're like, so. good hair. <laughs> nice hair. Well, yeah, we're just excited to do this show. We're doing it. We're watching Vice for the first time through. Melissa's making sure that we uh, understand what the show was actually about and me and John not being too confused at this time that was the mid 1980s i try okay i'm sorry i try <laughs> and, and a lot of things come up in the show that you know uh pop up in regular culture still today i mean we we talk about guest stars who got their start on vice who are still making movies we talk about uh music and all the different cultural aspects and sometimes even unfortunately bad news pops up after someone pops up in an episode, even if it was just a week or two ago. Yeah, we just had our last week's episode. And unfortunately, we find out as of today in this recording that he's passed away. And so we just got to know Arlie. And we obviously, he's been he's in a, huge a bunch of fantastic stuff, uh, including Full Metal Jacket. He was just one of our guest stars last week. Mm -hmm. And here we are. We've unfortunately lost a gunnery sergeant, retired Marine Corp. Drill instructor, guy served in Vietnam, just in, in incredible life. And he, he popped up in some pretty big name stuff, you know, I mean, doing obviously doing the war movies with Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket. But even, you know, stuff on the lighter side, he was in the story, Toy Story 2 and 3, just a great career. And we're really going to. Uh, we're we're going to miss him. A uh, good friend of Vice. Yeah, absolutely. And there is no way to transition out of that. We're really sad to hear about Arlie Ermey. Um, but let's go talk about this week's episode. This one takes a turn. We were on a great path, guys. <laughs> we, we were taking this great and they path. Were just veered right off. <laughs> and then the rest of the Vice team <laughs> suddenly died. <laughs> and all we have is Sonny Crockett. <laughs> let's go talk about this week's episode. <laughs> Okay, so I think this might be the first time we've ever had this where I said previously on Miami Vice. We've had times where they flash back to other episodes. But, but never like, that cheesy voice. Yeah, the actual <laughs> announcement. It was so 80s, like previously. <laughs> and now. And yeah, the and now tonight on Miami Vice. <laughs> it felt like the opening to a 
soap opera. It did very and much. And then that's what we got. Mm-hmm. We got a soap opera episode. I feel like I was so, watching Dynasty because they used to do like mm-hmm. like on like Knott's Landing or Dallas. Every every episode of Dallas would be previously on Dallas, and that same guy's mm-hmm. watching. <laughs> Interesting. Mm, and yeah. aren't they in the same time slot now? Yeah. Oh, wait. Okay. And it's, <laughs> oh. it's, it's got to be something off. You know what it's got to be? It's got to be Marlena style <laughs> amnesia. And they had to recover, you know, back. Oh, wait. Yeah. That's in the future of ice, too. We'll come back to that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just a reminder, Gordon is running a payola scam. He is also Caitlin's like manager, record label contact. Re- record label, like president or whatever. Yes. So he's not her manager. Yes. He also killed some guy named Tommy with a heavy metal tape yeah. in his Porsche. Uh, that was and, some metal. <laughs> <laughs> and Tommy also killed some guy named Will that Caitlin knew. I don't know. We find all that out at random points in time in this opening. It's covered at the same speed in, the, in the, like a hurricane episode, too. Yeah, so I like, mean, like, it, it was like we just watched the whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who cares about Will or Steve or whoever died? Yeah, um, we don't care. We never saw him. We don't know him. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is Crockett's first time in first class. <laughs> Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, we get to current time, and now we have someone uh, dressed as Judas Priest trying to get an autograph out of Caitlin in first class. Which makes no sense, right? No. Like, why would that guy want her autograph? <laughs> They're on their way to L.A. Remember, Sonny's off. He almost got murdered last week by a uh, um, <laughs> serial <vibrator>. killer <laughs> that was coming after his dick. So he needs a week off. Uh-huh. <laughs> so he's traveling with it's Caitlin. It's sick time. Yeah, <laughs> she he's traveling with Caitlin. They're going to L.A. She's going to do some record label stuff and then also do some stops, I guess. Like it's uh, like promotional tour, like promotional press conferences and party stuff. And the best part about this is when they pull up into L.A. and then they do the L.A. montage, just like they did in New York, where they show everything that's about Hollywood. And then you see all the press and fans out in front waiting for Caitlin to come in. Sonny gets shuffled to the back and then can't even get past the bouncer to follow his wife into the <laughs> hotel room. So now he knows what it's like. No, to be a but would you, if you were the bouncer, would you believe that she married this schlub? <laughs> <laughs> no, not with that hair. Yeah, no, cut your hair, Sonny. <laughs> Uh, yeah, tubs. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he would have been in there. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. Now, again, this week, we're going to do like we did last time. We're going to talk about all the guest stars right up front. And you know why? Because all of them were in like a hurricane. Right, John? Yeah, pretty much. They were all in like a hurricane or one of the other Sheena Easton episodes. We have Sheena Easton, Tuke Smith, Bob Gurchin, and Tony Henja all appearing again. So there's no real... New guest star, except the Jack Kenny, who's going to play Jerry Lee, who we're going to actually meet here uh, in a in about a scene or two. Jack Kenny is interesting because, yeah, he was an actor, but he was more famous for being a screenwriter, producer, and a director. First acting appearance was this episode of Vice, and he would go on to have writing credits that include Nickelodeon's The Secret World of Alex Mack, Dave's World, episodes of Caroline in the City, and episodes of Fling Skies. Oh, damn. That's a big, Mm -hmm. like, gamut of stuff that he covered, too. And it goes on. He also co-created the show Titus, comedian Christopher Titus's short-lived sitcom on Fox. He also co-created Wanda at Large, which was Wanda Sykes' short-lived sitcom on Fox. There has been a lot of short-lived sitcoms on Fox. (laughs) (laughs) So he was also the executive producer and showrunner of producing 63 episodes of the sci-fi show Warehouse 13. Mm. Actually, I really like that show. He wrote some episodes, directed some episodes, and even appeared in an episode, the series finale episode. One last thing about Jack Kenny. Jack Kenny has been with his husband, Michael Goodell, since August 1982. His husband, Michael Goodell, son of U.S. Senator Charles Goodell from New York, and brother of... NFL commissioner Roger Goodell. Oh, wow. I was like, kept thinking, like, that's. <laughs> yeah, it's like, weird. Goodell. Like, Goodell, can't Goodell. Why does that sound like? I can't be. And it's like, yeah, it is. Damn. So, small world. Oh. Yeah, what a small world. <laughs> Damn, that, that guy covers a wide gamut of stuff. 
too, like sci-fi and mm -hmm. comedy and uh, actually a lot of comedy, a little bit of sci-fi, but Caroline in the City and Wanda at Large and Titus. Yeah, and but, if only yeah I mean, Falling Skies and Warehouse 13. Yeah, I mean, you've got the sci-fi and then you've got the kids show and the uh, Alex Mack. Yeah, if only he could have brought some, you know, decent stuff with him over to Vice. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> well, he showed up as an actor, not a writer, producer, or director, <laughs> though I think he could have probably done a better job than some. <laughs> When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the hotel and Caitlin is meeting with all of her executives, the managers, like basically everyone associated with the record label. That's what she's there to do. And then she's also doing some promotion stuff. And once she gets everyone out, Sonny is pissed because it's not about him. He's mad that she's getting all this attention. He's mad because she's not safe. He's like, this isn't safe. That's not how this comes <laughs> off. That's not. Yeah. Well, that's that's what he is clearly mad that <laughs> yeah. he's taking second fiddle. No yeah. one's talking about Sonny. No one <laughs> talked about my hair. <laughs> wouldn't he's... even let him in the press conference. <laughs> He does say, like, your security detail, we, how come so many people are there? And she says, it's the PR's job. Like, they got people there. So I had this big open when I came in. Like, it makes it look like I'm a bigger deal than maybe what I am. Which you is know? probably true. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny just kind of pouts around in the hotel room for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand why he even came. Like, what do you think it was going to be like? He's still coming down off that drug, whatever Someone's he got, got hit with last week. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that night they go over to a club. It's like a 50s, 60s themed party Diner slash thing. dance club with go go dancers in cages. There's like cars parked on the dance floor and stuff like that, too. Sonny and Caitlin are there. And so is Gordon and Fremont. Now, these are the same two, the head of the record label, and then like his crony. They're there talking to somebody and Fremont says, Don't talk to this person. He's a loser and a nobody. He's a has been. <laughs> Here's the other person you really want to talk to, and that's Jerry. He's a celebrity the reporter, reporter for the National Inquisitor. And he wrote an article about Caitlin to make her, quote unquote, look like Mother Teresa. But they couldn't find anything on Sonny Burnett. And Gordon says he's just an import-export. But I was like, whatever. Import-export? You got really <laughs> excited about that. Oh, really? Import-export? <laughs> well, I know what that means. But I am confused because th does that mean that uh, she's married to Sonny Burnett, not Sonny Crockett? Is this a fake marriage? Are they not legally married? Yeah, because they could pull the marriage license and see that his name is Sonny Crockett. They could, but that, yeah, I mean, that, that never comes up. That's never addressed. Obviously, they talk it about the house. It never comes up that, the, that the uh, reporter never digs into this and finds out that Sonny Crockett's actually a cop. So, <laughs> no, is that, because that reporter is that was not that good of a reporter. <laughs> is that because she's married to Sonny Burnett? Is she really married to a drug dealer? Maybe they're not married at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's just never brought up. So, it's true. That's a good point, though. I mean, who knows? Like, I have my suspicions about when the reporter went around and asked about Sonny Burnett in Miami, too. But I'm going to come back to that later. Well, I mean, yeah. How did they, those people even really know? <laughs> we just know how many times yeah, Sonny's been on camera. Yeah, this reliable source named Izzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Izzy's going around like he's a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> the best part about this party is that it hits all the st stereotypes. So while Caitlin and Sonny are there, Caitlin gets grabbed by someone from Rat. I'm assuming maybe Cinderella <laughs> and gets pulled away to go talk to. And Sonny goes and sits himself at the bar and orders another blackjack, which he told a waitress that he wanted to. He needs more than get, one. He needs a bunch of blackjacks. And a man named Ralph comes up. Ralph Slick. Uh, introduces Ralph himself. Ralph not Slick. <laughs> hands him his card and puts some Coke on the business card. So Sonny just blows it off and tells him that his reputation sucks. And Rick is very upset about that. Did you see how offended he was by that? He was very offended. Yeah, he was like, he's what? so upset, he's not going to be in the rest of the episode. Nope. <laughs> That's it. I'm not even going to be it, in the rest of the episode. I'm taking my crappy Coke and I'm going home. <laughs> the next day at the hotel, Sonny is saying he's bored. Again, he's still Sonny, it's all about pouting. me. I can't do this. I, You're doing that. We can't spend our time together. I got nothing to do. But he doesn't want to bother her. I don't want to be a, a weight on you. Sorry. But I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I really am, actually. I'm just going to eat all these donuts. <laughs> <laughs> 
in, this conversation is interesting because she says this album is bigger than she anticipated it to be. And she wants to write it out because she's going to make more money off it than she thought. And it would set them up for the rest of their lives. Where Sonny was under the impression, like, I want you to keep making music, but apparently not live off of it, not make any money off it. Like, just make it and not he... sell it. What he, he seems like he's offended when she's like, "We, I could make all this money. We could live like this, you know, who we set for life. He's like, I thought we were doing fine now because he's not making any money. I think this is all about his ego is like taking a shot because she's actually the one who has all the money. But I don't understand what uh-huh. he thought when he married her, she was going to be a singer. Would he think she was going to stop singing? I mean, or just stop touring? I, I don't get where he's. Yeah, because like multiple times they have this conversation where she's like, "Like this is my livelihood. You're going to cost us, uh, cost me my livelihood and a lot of money that I can make." And his argument each time is, is "Well, that doesn't matter." <laughs> yeah. Look, Sonny, we're not going to live off the, off your four fifty an hour. <laughs> four fifty a week, okay. <laughs> That's four hundred and fifty dollars a week he makes. Oh, You're right, I thought John. it was four dollars and fifty cents an hour. <laughs> You're right, John. She does hammer on it pretty yeah. hard. Like, and then later she's like, "Why don't you stop investigating, Gordon?" That's a thing yeah. that she says later in this. Yeah, episode. because I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, we can talk about it later in the episode, but he doesn't have to investigate Gordon. It happened. What they're investigating for is obviously the guy, Tommy being blown up, but they're also investigating him for later on. You find out for another DJ being murdered, which has happened in California. So he doesn't have to investigate it. He just takes it, even though Castillo's like, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you should do this, not man. Not only did it not happen in Miami, it's murder, not drugs or hookers. Yeah, like, so what? <laughs> no part of this. <laughs> well, John, the next scene we have Gordon and Fremont talking in their car, and it's typical record label stuff we're expecting, I, I right? Wanted, yeah, I wanted to talk about these next scenes because he has a very weird relationship with his little cohort. They're in one of the most cozy cars I've ever seen. <laughs> like practically sitting like arms around each other, driving down the road. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're talking the whole time they're driving. You know, they're ta- they're in their evil bad guy plans and <laughs> everything. Totally 80s business guy fashion. The one thing we walk away out of this is that some blah 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 in her contract makes it so that she gets more money or more control over the record label after her tour they want the record to make a bunch of money but they don't want her to tour at all so yeah, they, they don't uh, want her to keep she gets more points like percentage points on the contract if she goes on this really long tour they know that she has a hard time touring especially now that she's newly married so they're planning on that they'll be able to keep a higher percentage of her take because she she won't come through with the tour because she has to tour in order to get that portion of it. We also find out that the the album actually sucks, and so they're talking about how they're going to have to hype the crap out of it. Yeah, they're talking about how the first three songs are good, and then the rest of it is crap. And they're like, now we don't, and we need to get the money before everyone figures out those first three songs are the only thing that are good. God, I hope the first three songs weren't what we heard in like a hurricane. <laughs> it's just that same song over and over again with the kids. It's actually just the kids singing. That's the good ones. So. Uh, Maybe Sunny sings the on whole it. album. <laughs> just her covering shares. Uh, I got you, babe. <laughs> I know. I think, I'm trying to think that's all Just she can sing. Stop. <laughs> so now Sunny's off to go back to Miami. Galen's saying for her tour slash promo stuff that she has to do there. Sunny is very clear with her manager, by the way, that he doesn't want her to get harassed and he doesn't like him. And the manager's like, when are you going home? Can I drop you off at the airport? It's so frustrating. The help need to understand they are to speak when spoken to. <laughs> I mean, nothing that guy said was wrong. He's like, yeah, you should go home. This isn't a good place for you. Sunday needs to write up like rules, you know, so that they know that they can't approach him or look him directly in the eye. He's too important. Well, you know, Steve Harvey did that and it didn't go over so well for him. <laughs> Crockett lands back in Miami and Tubbs picked him up from the airport. He's giving him a hard time about living a high life <laughs> He's now. like, sorry, my limo's in the shop. I couldn't pick you up. Tubbs, we miss you not seeing you on screen. Oh, Tubbs. Sonny says he's happy to be back in the real world. What's real, Sonny? I have a question for you, Sonny. What's real? Your yeah. boat? <laughs> your big giant that, that house car? that you live in? That, that giant mansion? Your clothes? Like, <laughs> what, which part of that? Tubbs isn't even your real best friend. <laughs> <laughs> he just gets paid At to least sit there with you. <laughs> 
<laughs> At least it's not Nutcase Central, he said about L.A. Now they head back over to the precinct, and suddenly he's talking to some guy with Castillo, and I think the guy, is he like a cop from he's California? Cop, yeah. Is that why he's a visitor? I don't know what division he's supposed to be in. I think he must be from California. I don't know, because it makes it, he says like something like out in California. So it makes me think like maybe he's not, maybe he's like a, a different division in Miami, and he's just... I think he's from California, and he's there to talk to Sonny. To say, hey, you live with her and married with her. Maybe Caitlin has some inf- inside information of what happened with Tommy. Yeah. Because that's what they're other, yeah. investigating. Yeah. I don't know. All I know is Crockett's kind of being a dickhead to him. He hasn't been very nice to people in this episode. I think the honeymoon's over. <laughs> in this conversation, this cop says that Tommy was ready to plea and turn over Wiggins and Fremont from Royalty Records, who's Caitlin's label. Now they think he killed Tommy, but before then he had killed a DJ. And there's a bunch of other things that they think that Gordon and Fremont are behind. And so Sonny says, okay, fine, I'll help you guys. I'll go back to California now and I'll go sneak around my wife and see if I can get information out of her and also investigate Gordon for you while I'm there, question mark. Yes, exactly. And then Tubbs in the next scene points out, like, why are you doing this? <laughs> yeah. And, and in the very next scene, after Tubbs points that out, he complains the whole time of how he made his wife a promise his work would invade their marriage. You know, oh, her work. like, yeah, his work and her work would yeah. not collide, basically, is what he said. And he did it on purpose. He could have easily said no. And that's exactly what Tubbs says. Like, you could have turned it over, you could have said no, but instead, you wanted to be involved with this. And Sonny says, well, if it was your wife, what would you do? And Tubbs is already like, I just said it. (laughs) I just told you. I wouldn't do it. You're messing with your marriage, man. What is wrong with you? (laughs) So He didn't even go look for Tubbs Tubbs Jr. (laughs) (laughs) He did too. We couldn't find him. Let let LAPD handle it. That's what they're there for. I mean, I think maybe they have cops in LA. I do want to point out that Crockett calls... (laughs) I do want to point out that Crockett does uh, refer to someone as tube steaks uh, <laughs> in this conversation. Yeah, he talks about uh, Gordon and what's the other guy? Fremont. Fremont being tube steaks. <laughs> well, I mean, Gordon kind of looks like a tube steak. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when we leave from the Crockett mansion at the National Inquisitor, Jerry is talking to his editor and say, yeah, OK, they say Sonny Burnett is in import export, but we know he's a dealer. And she's like, yeah. Go to Miami and go see what you can drum up. I can just see the headline now. Pop star marries dirtbag drug dealer. <laughs> At the precinct, Sonny's on the phone with Caitlin. He's like, no, I miss you more. No, they're She's doing like, like, I miss you. Some like, gross no, I like miss sex you talk or something. And that's exactly. Yeah. It makes me really uncomfortable to listen to them talk to each other because it's always in this code of like the dirty ass shit they've done to each other. Yeah, he's like, oh, I don't even care. Oh, stuff. I know. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> But yeah, what I do then, handcuff uh, you? <laughs> fortunate for us, the conversation gets interrupted because she was about to tell him where she was going to put that nightstick. And yeah, I think we got a preview last week. <laughs> it's gross. No, it's like listening to your parents talk to each other. Or something. It is. It's really uncomfortable and really gross how they talk to each other. Yeah, I don't know why, though. Why is it? Why do you think that is? I know, but Sonny's just having phone sex with his wife in the middle of the precinct. <laughs> <know>. Like. <laughs> have a phone at home okay that boat doesn't have a phone <laughs> he's got a hooker line at <laughs> home true. he can totally do it on the hooker <laughs> line <laughs> cue sex club montage sex world and Don hey. on henley music playing in the background <laughs> kick when you're up <laughs> this reporter there. has every opportunity to find out who sunny burnett is and hits all sunny's favorite spots the hooker club Raul's, <laughs> sex world copacabana <laughs> house <laughs> just talk to hookers on the street old guys like... playing che- <laughs> yeah old guys checkers for some reason <laughs> the cuban guys with the, the little cuban coffees <laughs> and also if they wanted to really dig deep they could probably find out he's actually a cop too yeah I mean, because he's terrible at hiding that he's a cop yeah and he's been he's been just... found out by so many suspects that he's a cop that's why he can't go to prison. They're like, we can't send you in another cover because they all know you. <laughs> Every bartender should have been like, you're looking for, you're looking for Sonny Burnett. Yeah, okay, he's really Sonny Crockett. You might want to stay away from that guy. Yeah, he's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a cop. He lives on that boat. You see the dock across the way. He's got an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis comes in here all the time. No, we gotta no. feed him. 
So, no, instead, he buys in all the stories, all the made-up stories in the crime world about Sonny Burnett that makes Sonny Burnett like Tony Montana, drug dealer who murders people and does all these bad things. <laughs> He's got a story so good, he calls and says, stop the presses. I'm running back home so that you could run this on page one. No, don't worry about that alien birth or whatever he says. <laughs> yes. Reputable, <laughs> that paper is. <laughs> Uh, Over at the hotel, Sonny is surprising Caitlin. He just talks his way in. Like, no, it's okay. It's a surprise. He just the, takes the key and then heads up to the room. The lady's like, huh? Well, no, the clerk. Did you see her face? She was scared <laughs> of him. She's like, oh, my God, it's a stalker. <laughs> I'm sure she was on the phone to security immediately after. He walks in just in time to see PR person leaving from the hotel room. And he talks to Caitlin and says, hey, so we're screwed. They think that you're a murdering drug dealer and i'm married to you now surprise Thanks. you in my life <laughs> <laughs> i think it is wait till you find out that there are pirates that want to kill us <laughs> <laughs> outside at the newsstand gordon and fremont are on their run and they see the paper too Fremont's like, this is really bad. And Gordon's like, this is fantastic. We're going to be able to take this and be able to turn this into more money. But now we have both ends of the spectrum here. Caitlin, we find out in the previous scene that she's supposed to be the squeaky clean, drug-free image. That's what her image is all about. And now it's totally tarnished because Sonny Burnett is this murdering drug dealer. And Gordon Fremont yeah, now have leverage. Squeaky clean. Like yeah. squeaky clean, like Britney Spears clean, <laughs> like Christina Aguilera clean. <laughs> the next day in the limo, Caitlin is pissed. She is really pissed. Awkward. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> There's nothing they can do about it. It's just what it is. Like that they found out he can't say that he's a cop. And he says, like, hey, I'll just tell him I'm a cop. She's like, don't make promises you can't deliver on. Okay, but what does she want him to do? Like, yeah. this to ruin his whole life because she can't, like, wait, what? He could die if they find he's a cop. Someone could kill him. <laughs> That's but better. I mean, you go tour with your terrible music <laughs> that no one wants to hear and no one she, wants to go on your tour anyway. <laughs> the line she dropped, though, don't dangle solutions you can't fulfill and i'm yeah. a like, ouch. ouch yeah i know right like, oh my god <laughs> they pull up to the restaurant and reporter start asking a whole bunch of questions and that national inquisitor jerry reporter asks is it love or ludes <laughs> and then sunny punches him out it was like something on a tmv <laughs> <laughs> because assault charges always make situations better yeah i know that's like the worst thing he could have done <laughs> so the next day at the hotel no, he's not just a drug dealer he's a bully <laughs> <laughs> the next day at the hotel they're looking at the paper the story's running on the front page of sunny punching out a reporter and her manager's there like okay um when is he gonna go home because <laughs> like doesn't he have business to do or something like i'm trying to be as delicate as i can about it, this he's ruining your life <laughs> and, and at first it, she's trying really hard to, i think she's rethinking this marriage he is not the drug dealer she thought she married <laughs> She cannot be more mad right now. And this is also when she says this. Obviously, you didn't think that I was just going to make music like the business side is just as important as making the music. And I don't like it either. But Sonny really floats out there for real. Like, I thought you would continue to make music as in record it at the house and keep it. I don't and know. not sell albums. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's yeah, what that's he's what he, saying here. He was trying to say, like, why do you have to, why do you, yeah. the world have to hear your music? Why can't you just make music? She goes, because that's the point of my career. That's essentially that's like, what I he want thought. She, she was going to marry him and then she and was going to retire. Career. Career. Yeah. Yeah. And this is also when she it was going to be a housewife. And then, yeah. So she's not hearing none of that. She is, I mean, up to her eyeballs in red. She is so angry at Sonny. And then she says, why don't you just stop investigating if, them because you're going to ruin my career? I know that they're my record label and you're saying that they're guilty of these murders, but it's all not based on it's all circumstantial evidence. So yeah. why don't you back off? Like, don't tell, don't talk to me and, about it until you have you have evidence. And this is when she puts two and two together and realizes he did not come to see you in L.A. He came to investigate your bosses. He's here on the job. And I thought she was going to throw a phone or a shoe at him at, the, uh, yeah, at that point. You know, I, I, I definitely thought there was a Motel 6 in Sonny's future. 
at the end, she says, I don't care what you're here for and what you're doing. Keep me out of it. Do not include me in any of this. Pretty clear. She don't want to be involved in it. Don't tell me unless you have hard evidence. You're like arresting them and leave me out of it. At the sauna. Back to the creepy two guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Back to the, the, the creepy evil uh, business partners. <laughs> now they're taking a steam together. Is no one going to talk about that guy's so, shorts yeah, when know, they were running? cozy enough. <laughs> No one's going to talk about Gordon Shore there running by the magazine stand. They were basically underwear. He also skips leg day quite often. Yeah. Also, he's like pastier than pasty. It was bad. All, all I know like is they need money. A they spent all of it on small. Uh, they spent it all on small cars and steam and steams. <laughs> and small shorts. They're talking to their business person. Because you only got money for 60 days. They're like, huh? <laughs> okay, well, maybe you should be a better business manager and tell us these things. <laughs> Why are we just finding this out now? <laughs> Wiggins or Gordon. Gordon. Is, Gordon is like, don't worry about it. I got it. We're going to use this Burnett thing to our advantage. Whatever that no means. No one knows how that's going to happen, though. No. At the studio, Caitlin's having a <laughs> conversation with a man that has fantastic hair. No, it's a wig. It has to be. <laughs> That was the worst mullet I have ever seen. It was Dude, like this is like take reverse mullet or something. I don't even know what the hell that was. The best part about this Dude, conversation this is like take for three hundred. You can see like at first producers like let's try it again. Like come on, <laughs> sing the damn song, and then she starts asking them questions and stuff, and and starts asking them uh, uh, about his marriages because apparently he's been divorced like five times. Going through all the reasons, you know, I, I was never home. All the touring got in the way, and I'm thinking in my head, or it could have been the heroin addiction, maybe. <laughs> and Melissa, just remember with that hair. He says that one of the reasons why he got divorced because there was too many groupies. Oh, yeah, because that hair. <laughs> women got to touch it. <laughs> I was convinced it was a wig. <laughs> <laughs> so she has this conversation with him where he says it's just part of the job. You you are married to the job. You cannot stay married. It's this job is going to ruin your marriage. At the hotel, Sonny's on the phone with Tubbs. And Tubbs is like, man, this job kills marriages. <laughs> yeah, he's doing the same thing. What did you expect was going to happen? I told you not to do it. <laughs> don't marry her. Don't go investigate her bosses. What are you doing? <laughs> Look at me. I'm swinging bachelor. Got nothing to tie me down. No kids. No <laughs> wife. Well, one kid. Somewhere. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the club, we have a quick scene with Fremont and Gordon where they're talking about, again, that they're going to use Burnett to solve all their money problems. They head over to the hotel. They see Simon leaving in another, like... He rented that. He They're like, oh, a rent a Ferrari or whatever. Like, how so L.A.? Like, why would he rent that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I have what no a idea. Phony. <laughs> I know, it's such a phony. But they corner him before he's phony. able to leave. And they say, hey, we we might want to do a deal with you. They go for a walk along the waterfront. This is way they more complicated than what it needs to be. They go for a stroll along the yeah. beach. This is when we find out they are terrible criminals. Sonny first approaches them. One of them says, like, he looks scary. He might be carrying a gun. And then they go on to have this meeting, tell Sonny, we want you to sell our drugs in Miami for us because we don't know what the hell we're doing. It's stuck in Nassau. We need you to get it out of there and then move it in. It's a hundred keys of cocaine. If if he was a cop, just a reminder, if he was a, if he was a cop, if they knew he was a cop, they announced exactly what they wanted him to do, what they were selling, when it was going to happen. Like, they indicted themselves 100% in that conversation. Yeah, he could have just said, like, okay, I can arrest you now. Uh-uh. Got to follow this through. <laughs> he was distracted by the girl on the roller skates. Yeah, I want to think everyone was, really. You know. <laughs> what, 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 what did you say? Something about Coke? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <huh? laughs> Their hope here is that they can get Sonny to move the drugs in and then either A, he's going to get arrested and bring Caitlin down. She can't tour. They'll get her money. Or B, they're going to have him and Caitlin killed and it's going to look like a drug deal that's gone bad. And then therefore, Caitlin can't tour. They'll keep the money. We know it's the latter of the two. And they also, after they're done doing the deal with them, Sonny takes off, you know, and they kind of give us the that hint that they're going to try and at least kill his wife. Oh, what a prick. Like, I can't wait to murder his wife. Kind of. <laughs> Pavro, at the end of the scene. And he runs off back to the hotel. He stops off and talks to Angie. And Angie's like, you are kind of an asshole. 
But I like you, <laughs> and I like Caitlin, so I'm hoping the best for you. But you still are an asshole. And this can't work. <laughs> she is basically the female Tubbs. I said it. She's the female version of Tubbs, right? She's the best friend who's like, this isn't going to work. She's telling Caitlin, like, hey, you got to give him space. It's his job. He's got to do yeah, it. Yeah, she's, she's Caitlin's Tubbs. Yeah, exactly. So she's, yeah. And then Sunny runs downstairs and tells Caitlin the entire case. <laughs> The, everything, everything like, that Gordon is <laughs> guilty of. She says she wanted out of it. She's also, a police officer shouldn't be sharing this information, at, especially not in a public pool. <laughs> but they're just walking along. Also, she's he, trying to go swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Way to ruin the swim hour. <laughs> and she says, why can't the locals handle it? Question. <laughs> Well, now it's it's in Florida, though. <laughs> well, not yet. They're still in Miami. Yeah, that's true. And he said, well, let's go back yeah. to Miami. Also, he doesn't live in Nassau, so <laughs> I don't think he polices the Nassau. The conversation does, like most, uh, most of their conversations lately, goes back to about money, where she basically accuses him of not liking being rich. <laughs> they eventually come together and says, I'm going back to Miami to go bust Gordon. She's like, okay, fine. I'll come back to Miami with you, I guess. This is what I'll have to do. Really we nervous jump. at the end of the scene. <laughs> we go I, to I the thought for sure they would break into a, a, another rendition, rendition of I Got You, Babe. Like <laughs> it, it got cheesy really, really fast at the end. <laughs> so now they're back at the Crockett Mansion. Gordon calls. Deal is set up for tonight. He also says that Caitlin's photo shoot has changed from tomorrow to tonight at 8 p.m. So he's going to split them up and they're not going to be in the same place. It's going to be easier to take care of business. Sonny calls in backup for 11 o'clock at his drug deal, not 8 o'clock at Caitlin's photo shoot. Because he's not thinking that that's going to mm -hmm. be anything. But, you know, a sudden change in the schedule should have been. <laughs> hmm. If only he were a detective, he would know. <laughs> no. He's not, though. <laughs> <laughs> So now we go to the final scene of the episode. I'm going to kind of lump the last one in here. So he's dropping Caitlin off at this photo shoot, but he decides to hang out for a while. And it's like, hey, I got time. It's 8 o'clock. I don't have to be go buy 100 keys of Coke until 11, so well, I got some time. I mean, I think he was going to just drop her off, but then he saw the other model was taking off her shirt, so he was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to hang around. <laughs> yeah, and this other model, this other model, she's almost done, you know, almost done. The, nice girl, Ivanka Crusher Neck, I think is her name. <laughs> Sunny goes for a walk outside while they're waiting for their turn to take pictures because the photographer's busy with this model. And he sees Fremont and Gordon come pulling up. And they both have this scowling, suit, suspicious look on their faces to come pulling up. They look too. menacing while they're in their car driving around like, we're going to kill you. <laughs> like, it's not done yet. Way to spoil it. Stoking their drawn on mustaches. <laughs> exactly. Why are they even there? They're not the ones that were coming to shoot them. They were just driving by to see if they had done. I guess. Like, you're too early, stupid. We haven't done it yet. They're really dumb because of how this goes. Yes. Sunny runs back in, tackles Caitlin. The photographer and the model are actually hitmen. Surprise. Sh shootout. Sunny sneaks around, is able to kill both of them. Then runs outside after hiding Caitlin underneath the sheet. He goes running. <laughs> you back can't outside. assassinate the great Sonny Burnett. <laughs> Didn't you hear the stories? Yeah, exactly. He goes running straight at Gordon and Fremont's car, who sees Sonny and go, "Oh shit!" <laughs> Their face. Oh my god, Gordon's face was the best thing about that the whole entire episode. He was like, "Oh my god!" Do it in dead. reverse. They run over some art installation that causes the car to flip. Sonny runs over, pulls Gordon out. The car explodes, killing Fremont. And then Sonny reads Gordon his rights, and Gordon's like, "You can't leave it. You're a cop. We can work something out." <laughs> Driving reverse is hard, you know. It's almost like things are coming at you from behind you. And I love after they crash, when Gordon gets out, it, it gets away. He doesn't like get out and like turn around. Right. He he's like he like waddles about five feet before Sunny tackles him. <laughs> And then at the end of, of all of that, like, he's caught the bad guy. He killed the killers. He sa saved the wife. And the whole time I'm thinking in my head, I wonder how things are going at the docks with 
<laughs> add in the backup. <laughs> Waiting around. <laughs> and then in the last scene of the episode, the couple's talking at the Crockett Mansion. She's saying, I'm going to miss you. I'm going on my tour. I have all these stops. I'm going to be gone for a long time. Three and- weeks. <laughs> hey now. Hey now. <laughs> yeah, that song in the background. Don't dream it's over. <laughs> And you know what? Thank God she's leaving. Because if she couldn't handle this case with her record label executive being a murderer, she's not going to be able to handle the bull scheme and smuggling <laughs> ring next week. So it's probably for the best that she's leaving. She can't handle Crockett be- pertaining to be a cowboy. <laughs> and then not much longer after that, there's the baseballs of death. So I don't know how she's going to handle any of those. <laughs> and the episode ends with the freeze frame of Sad Crockett. Sad Crockett has returned, people. <laughs> well, that's better than Happy Crockett. It's so creepy. Yeah, but than Bone Sack. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> the only thing is worse is Tubbs' feet sex. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the end of this episode. And I, I hope have in the many. next episode they tell us how things went at the docks. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys ever come home? <laughs> was a good episode. Okay, I'm going to say it's a good episode. With a cat, I'm going to say for my final thoughts. Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> this going to go bad. <laughs> <laughs> I have many things to dispute already. <laughs> well, before we get there, let's go talk about this week's music. Because this week's music is huge. Including Don Henley. You know, I'm sure the other two bands are worth something, <laughs> but, it's but Dawn, Dirty okay. Laundry and Don Henley is in this episode. So let's go talk about them. All right, John, I'm going to look at my phone the entire time until you start talking about Don Henley, because that's not <laughs> what I'm in here for. I'm here for Don Henley and Dirty Laundry, <laughs> which I found out there's an embargo on you can't find on YouTube. So I had to do some real searching to go and listen to a full version of the song after hearing it in the episode. What else you got for us this week, John? Well, I want to start out with the song I was seeing moment moment ago. Don't Dream, <laughs> It's Over by Crowded House. Crowded House is an Aussie New Zealand band. Neil Finn, vocalist and guitarist, is a New, Ze- New Zealander. Whereas Nick Seymour and Paul Hester on bass and drums were Aussies. They were formed in Melbourne, Australia in 1985 and actually saw quite a bit of international success off of their first few albums and then things kind of trail off from there. The band saw most of their success, their first self-titled debut album, uh, which actually reached number 12 on U.S. album charts in 1987 and provided top 10 hits, uh, Something So Strong and this song. Most of their success later in their career, though, was in Australia and New Zealand. Their fourth albums actually saw success in UK, Europe, and even South Africa. Finn and Hester were former members of a New Zealand band called Split Ends that was actually founded by Finn's older brother, Tim Finn. They would form Crowded House. The funny thing about them being in Tim Finn's previous band was at somewhere around their third album, the band had taken a break after a Canadian leg of their Temple of the Low Men tour. Finn and his brother Tim actually co-wrote an album called Finn. And then Neil would start working the follow-up third album with Hester and Seymour, but what they would give to the record company would be rejected. So Mm. Neil asked Tim, hey man, can I use some of the songs that we recorded on for Finn? His brother Tim was like, oh, you know, jokingly said yes, only if he becomes a, a member of the band. <laughs> so in 1990, he officially joined the band as they used multiple songs off of their record <laughs> Finn for their third album. <laughs> it actually leave uh, about a year or two later. They would break up in 96. Tim and Neil Finn would go on to do solo work, whereas the drummer, Paul Hester, would actually work with children's entertainers, the Wiggles. He would play <laughs> Paul the Cook. Oh, I know who Paul the Cook is. <laughs> In my the, years of watching the, the Wiggles. That's the house. <laughs> <laughs> would also have his own ABC uh, show in Australia called Hesse's Shed. Uh, I don't want to uncomfortable at all. <laughs> that I have not seen. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So, and 
on Hesse's shed in 1997, it would be the last actual time that Finn, Seymour, and Hester performed together on a stage. They would perform together to promote Neil Finn's solo record that was releasing the following year. Unfortunately, in 2005, Hester died by suicide. Oh, wow. After he died, in 2006, the band would reform with Matt Sherrod over drumming and they would actually release two uh two more albums and both would reach number one on aussie charts in 2010 the band would will have uh, had officially sold over 10 million records damn let's move on let's talk about devil with blue dress on and good golly miss molly which was our second song of the episode by mitch Ryder and the detroit wheels so mitch Ryder. He was born William S. Levi's Jr. He has, <laughs> yeah, no, nothing. No Mitch in there at all. Uh, he, he's released over two dozen albums over more than four decades. His first band, what it, his first band in high school was the band Tempest. They actually gained some local notoriety and he would eventually change the name to Billy Lee and the Rivieras. They would see limited success until record producer Bob Crew, who would rename the group Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, would get involved. Crew would uh, really help them get a record contract, and they would end up releasing several hit records in the 1960s, this song being uh, probably the most notable. In Ryder's heyday, he would actually be the last person to ever perform with Otis Redding. He would perform mm. Knock on Wood, December 9th in 1967 on a Cleveland, Ohio local television show called Upbeat. After the show, Redding and four members of Redding's backing band, the Barclays, would die in a plane crash near Madison, Wisconsin on December 10th. Damn. Ryder would end up seeing less success by the mid to late 70s, and he would eventually stop performing with the Detroit Wheels. Uh, he wouldn't stop performing altogether, but he did take kind of a hiatus from music for a while. There's, there's a few biographies out there that say he stopped because he had throat issues uh, ultimately, he would take uh, take up writing and painting and spend some time with his wife in Colorado before jumping back into music in 1983 to release an album that was produced by John Mellencamp called Never Kick a Sleeping Dog. Good, good advice. That <laughs> album would be the last of his albums. Yeah, uh, th that would actually be the last to score on the Billboard Hot 100 for him. He would continue to and record music and actually release his first album in the U.S. in almost 30 years in 2012. Wow. And finally, that brings us to Don Henry's Dirty Laundry. So I'm Don listening. Henley is in the Eagles. <laughs> All right, back to you, Don. <laughs> We've talked about our personal favorites from the Eagles, right? And that's Glenn Fry. He's had a lot of time in Vice. We've mm -hmm. talked a lot about him. It's Don Henley's turn. God damn yeah. It. Okay. <laughs> and don't pick anybody else. There is only Glenn Fry and Don Henley. There is nobody else. <laughs> All right. So Don Henley was a founding member of the Eagles. He was a drummer and co-lead singer from 1971 to 1980. And then he would join the reunion of the band from 94 to 2016. And then they would reform again in 2017 after Glenn Fry's death. Let's just focus on Don Henley for a bit. Start the journey. He was born Donald Hugh Henley in Gilmore, Texas. In high school, he joined a band called the Four Speeds in 1964, would be renamed Felicity. That's a weird Felicity change. <laughs> I'm like, that's a weird yes. change. <laughs> that's an odd name. Okay. Okay. So, but Felicity would be held across by fellow Texan Kenny Rogers. And Kenny <laughs> Rogers would take an interest. Kenny Rogers has a big heart. <laughs> 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 Kenny Rogers would have to help them change their name one more time, this time to Shiloh, because that's better than Felicity. <laughs> They would become Shiloh, and they would record a few singles for Kenny Rogers, 
Uh, one of which would actually kind of uh, would actually do pretty good. And actually, before everything was said and done, Kenny Rogers helped get them a record contract. But unfortunately for Shiloh, right before their album dropped, one of their band members, Jerry Surratt, uh, would die in a horrible dirt bike accident. Mm. I don't know if it was a horrible Damn. dirt bike oh, accident. God. I added horrible dirt bike accident. <laughs> Those goddamn motorcycles they have claimed so many people in this music segment. The accident caused another lineup shuffle. They had just signed with Amos Records. They're in LA. They had this little snafu. In Los Angeles is where Henley would meet fellow Amos record musician Glenn Fry, who was signed as part of a duo called Long Branch Henny Whistle. <laughs> Okay, someone needed to discuss names with these people. <laughs> they were bad. One of the members of Long Branch Penny Whistle would get together with a member of Shiloh, who <laughs> used to be Felicity. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow they would become the Eagles. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> so, but before that, before that, the members of Long Branch Penny Whistle <laughs> and Glenn Fry would serve as Linda Ronstadt's backup band for a 1971 <laughs> tour. <laughs> After the tour, feeling super confident, realizing that Shiloh wasn't going to get back together, Jerry really held the band together. And so when he <laughs> died in that dirt bike accident, it just... It's tore, it just tore apart. apart. Yeah. Yeah. So Henley and Fry would form the Eagles. Obviously, Eagles, they would have a ton of, of major hits. The Eagles have sold over 150 million records. 150 million, folks. They've won <laughs> six Grammys. That's like a Grammy every 30 million records. In 1980, they would break up, and Don Henley, as a solo artist, he wouldn't do so bad himself. In fact, he would sell over 10 million as a solo artist, including eight top 40 hits and two Grammys. Yeah, not bad. Not shabby. <laughs> I, I think up, two, two Grammys compared to the six Grammys would mean Don Henley was essentially one for the Eagles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think that's an accurate statement. <laughs> After the Eagles broke up, Henley would go solo. So would Walsh. He's had a, a pretty good successful career. He's had some pretty big hits. So Dirty Laundry was actually his biggest hit because that got him in, uh, up to number three on the charts. My favorite solo song of his is the Boys of Summer got him to number five. You know, I would say The Boys of Summer would be my favorite it's, Henley it's song, too, too. Except for the goddamn San Francisco Giants use that song in all of their promos, and I hate the Giants. Yeah, I that's hate true. them. They did ruin it. And uh -huh. so it's ruined that song for me. <laughs> what about a New York Minute? Come on, people. That's an amazing song. <laughs> now, let's just take it back. So in 1980, after the Eagles break up. The first thing Don Henley actually did was he recorded a duet with his then girlfriend, Stevie Nicks, mm -hmm. called Leather and Lace. That song would actually make the top 10 on the adult contemporary charts. Then he would release his first solo album, which would contain Dirty Laundry, which would hit number three on the Hot 100. Later, he would also hit number three on the rock chart with Who Owns This Plane, that would also be that would be from the 1986 The Color of Money soundtrack. Mm. As I like to do, ultimately he he continues to make solo music. In fact, he's he released albums in 2011 and 2015. I mean, he's recently released solo music. Two other things about Don Henley's story: numerous upon numerous legal battles with his Geffen label. He was always, they were suing him or he was suing them. Just never go along with David Geffen. And then one thing that I read and I thought was very strange, I, I think would be a, a lot bigger deal these days. In 1980, Don Henley called paramedics to his home where a 16 year old naked girl was found claiming to be overdosing on quaaludes and cocaine she that would have, was... she would be actually arrested that night she would actually be arrested that night for prostitution at the <laughs> same time a 15 year old girl found in that same home would be arrested for being under the influence of drugs henley later not that night but later be charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor he would receive a 2500 hundred dollar fine and two years probation Holy shit. How does that work? Hmm. How does that work? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Just tell me. Tell me. Tell me how 
it, 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 I mean, this. How could this happen? Like now, just imagine your favorite rock star pops uh, or pop star calls the police. They show up. There are two naked underage uh, women there, high on drugs. The rest of the two underage naked women, but, but not the pop star or rock star. And later, they just give them a little fine for you know giving drugs to the minors. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't happen nowadays. <laughs> Wow. Is he still your favorite eagle, Dominic? <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Well, of course, the music segment always takes a turn right at the end. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I got many. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm going to kick off this week. And you know when I kick off this week, there's a fucking problem. <laughs> Comes out, guns <laughs> Normally I let other people go first and I'll kind of close it out or something like that. I'll sound shit. But when I start off, I got something serious I got to talk about. This is a really good episode. It has a solid plot line. It covers very intimately what it's like being married to a pop star and like the record industry during the 80s. If this was the Sunny Burnett show, but this is Miami Vice. No, apparently it's the Sunny Burnett show where no one else is involved. <laughs> <laughs> so although I was entertained by this episode and I, I liked watching it, and I thought it was really good. This is not an episode of Miami Vice. I missed seeing the ladies and Castillo and having Tubbs being part of it. And then the shootouts and the action and the crime and solving for hookers and drugs and guns and smuggling and all this stuff. But instead, we got sappy love story with a forced police situation that had to be resolved while Sonny happened to be in town. Like I said, I like it. I like this episode a lot. If it was a different show and uh, at the very beginning when it's like previously on Miami Vice and then now today on Miami Vice, that was like the leading indicator right there. I was like, okay, this show has gone somewhere different. This is not Miami Vice territory. This is a different show. I would say that if this is where they wanted to take the show, then that's fine. And this, But I think they backed themselves into this corner by having him get married. And that if they wouldn't have had him get married, they would be able to skirt around this. And I think that they saw it at the end of this episode by Caitlin going on a long tour that Sonny is not invited on. Exactly. So she's just out. She's gone. <laughs> so I think this was a necessary episode that they had to do so that they could patch up the Gordon storyline and send Caitlin off on her way. And then we can get back to being Miami Vice that they got back to North Corner here because of the marriage and who Caitlin is and everything that they had to do something to ship her off. Not only that, but she's a pop star in real life. She's Sheena Easton. She has other stuff to do than be on the show too. So she has a guest spot on ALF next. She's got <laughs> places to be. <laughs> so this was a necessary episode. I had fun watching it. It was okay. It just wasn't Miami Vice. That's where my frustration is, is that this wasn't an episode of my device. This was an episode of the Sonny Crockett show. John, what are your final thoughts? Less entertained than you are, but I agree with you 100% that this is not Miami Vice. Yes, I, technically, there were drugs somewhere that were somehow involved with what we were doing. But we never saw them. We never dealt with them. We never even went to the docks when they were being arrested and confiscated. <laughs> He's still mad about that dock thing. <laughs> I need to know what happened at the dock. Don't be confused. There was no drugs. There was no hookers. There was no Castillo. There was no ladies and, and tubs action. There was just Crockett and his wife. And the most un Miami Vice thing ever. We finished the storyline. <laughs> What do you guys think you are finishing like the storyline? That, that should have been a dead giveaway. If, if a storyline isn't finished in in the first episode, if it's a multiple episode one, we're never going to finish it. We're <laughs> never going to get these answers. But for some reason, they decided, we're going to finish this one. Like, this is the one. This is the one we have to finish. So, yeah, we get the, the Sunny Croc show. And what bothers me is, like, it just brought, but there there were still questions. What happened at the docks? What is the deal with with the whole Burnett thing? Because yeah, I would she's think she's still married to a yeah, murdering drug dealer. They did not. So that's, <laughs> yeah, they did not solve that problem. She's still going to go on tour, and no. her fans still think he's a murdering drug dealer, huh? Yes. <laughs> so I just I am confused, and I can't wait till we get back to Miami and we get back to some to, to, to some hookers and some good old Izzy and storylines coming up. 
So well, thank God Izzy's going to introduce us to a bull semen smuggling ring next week. Who else would do it? <laughs> <laughs> Who else would know someone like that? Uh, after this episode, I need some Izzy in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, I can't really add much more than what you guys have added. I didn't. I don't like this episode, so I'm not even. I wasn't entertained at all. I was bored through the whole thing. The Kate and uh, Sunny story are boring to me. <laughs> it is. It's boring. It's not relatable. It's not Miami Vice. It's not why I started watching Miami Vice. And there was no tubs. There's like no tubs at all. Also, I would like to point out that neither one of you, when you said in your final thoughts, you said like it was missing the girls. It was missing. You know, no one said Swiatek. <laughs> Poor Switek is still alone in the van doing his magic, and you guys don't even want him in the show. I want you, Switek. I missed you. <laughs> I missed your pantsuits. <laughs> Neither one of you did it. Um, now, it, like you said, it's more like a soap opera. Which, hey, I like soap operas. I got nothing against soap operas. I watched. So I watched Dallas in the eighties. I watched all those shows, but that's not what I was watching Miami Vice for. Also, their love story is not believable. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm happy to see her go. <laughs> Bye. See you later. Have fun on your tour. <laughs> no, I mean, of all the women he's dated, that's who gets him. Like, that's who reels him in. I don't think so. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm I'm happy that it's done, and it was. Hey, we got a we got closure to a story no one cared about. <laughs> 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 and that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. As always, we would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Instagram at Go With The Heat. Facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. Anchor.fm, Stitcher, YouTube, you name it, we're there. Go With The Heat. You know how to find us. That's where we are. That's who we are. Go With The Heat. We would also love to see a review of the show. It helps other people find the show. It helps other people know that you listen to it go ahead and go to your podcast your platform of choice it could be things like anchor or stitcher or it could be just traditional rss like me us old people around here that still remember that rss exists and you could just add a link into a feed reader and you can listen to it anytime you want to go to that podcast or that podcatcher platform of choice give us five stars Whatever the highest rating is for jumping frogs, whatever the <laughs> highest rating is on that podcast platform of choice, but don't review the show. No one ever reviews the show. Go ahead and put in the comments if they're going to make you put a comment. Tell us which one is your favorite eagle and why. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out that website. Go with the heat.com. You can find all the way to contact us, all the ways to subscribe to the show, get those RSS feeds. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We're in the middle of season four. We're starting to think ahead to what's going to happen at the end of my advice. Go to that Patreon. Show us some support and let us know what you think about the future of Go With The Heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.